Uh, well, wait a second. Okay, guys, so, uh, here I am. Actually, I think my mic's gonna drop now. Yeah. Um, so, hey, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I have to fix my mic real quick, but after that, we're gonna start. Uh, so the plan today is to read a book. The plan is to, uh, we're gonna read this book together. Oops, I did not open this site. Um. <laughs> So uh, we're going to read Bishop together. Uh, and I mean, we're just going to see how far we're going to get. Because um, I think it's nice to like run through a book together. Uh, we could make some notes. Uh, I want to actually open it in Adobe, in Adobe uh, Reader. Because um, you can strike things through very easily with that, right? So let's open this up, pattern recognition and machine learning. Um, we might do the exercises. Okay, I, I'm gonna have to fix my, uh, I'm gonna have to fix the mic real quick. Maybe I can keep it like this. How is this? Is this a, I hope this sounds decent this way. Um. So yeah, let's get started. Um, gonna scoot this a bit closer. Oops. He. <laughs> uh, I think it should be fine. Like, so this is the mic. This is the mic. Uh, I hope it's not distracting for you guys. All right. Now it's out of focus. So, okay, I hope you guys don't mind that the mic's kind of floating midair. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for having me today. Um, I'm not expecting anyone to watch, but let's open up our uh, super work. And we're going to read a book together, so that's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for tuning in today. Let's open super work. Maybe I should shout out on discord that i'm live but let's see okay so we're opening super work which takes a while we can already make a new latex file actually uh let's make a new latex file uh do i have or maybe an org file should i make an org file hmm okay so uh hmm. <laughs> so we're opening super work right now and uh there we are so this is the 12th stream if i'm correct uh stream 12 yep gotta quickly open obs on the other screen <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So sorry. Um, I'm gonna disable the preview, and I kind of want to scoot it over a bit so I can see the chat. All right, that's good. Yep, that's real good. All right. Um, so let's uh, let's duplicate this. <laughs> It's already the 3rd of December. That's almost the 5th of December. Which is almost already a Dutch holiday we have over here, which is called Sinterklaas. So stream 12, uh, 3rd of 12, 2018. So what am I trying to accomplish? Um, not really any specific goal in mind, uh, but rather we are going to start reading uh, Bishop's pattern recognition and see how far we are going to get. Why is this value important? Um, we already uh, did some machine learning, but it was kind of ad hoc, right? This might provide us with a more uh, solid basis. How will I know if this is complete? Uh, let's set a goal of reading 10 pages. 
any risks, of course. We have the internet, we have Reddit, we have social media. We have my phone. Is this concrete or ambiguous? It's quite concrete. So reading 10 pages is uh, quite concrete. Anything else? No. So let's start a timer. So I'm going to set a timer for 45 minutes now. What is the one thing I want to accomplish? In this session, I want to make a logic file. Um, and read the first page. That sounds like a good. So say we're to finish, we could read the second page. How will I get started? Open the PDF and get to work. What hazards? Internet phone. Those are the main distractions. All right. Well then. Um, uh, so let me um, let me create a new file. Uh, I'm gonna have to think a bit. Um, Do I want my own? Uh... So let's see. I'm looking. I'm looking for my. Uh, looking for like a LaTeX uh, kind of template I can use because I have a lot of custom commands that are really nice uh, that I use a lot. So uh, let's see if we. I think we have ML book is. Uh, I think ML book is. Maybe we should write in this. Maybe we should write in this. Uh, maybe we should not write in bishop, but we should write in this thing. That might. Mm. Yeah, you know what? Let's. Mm. So the question is: Should I continue in ML book, or should I continue in? Yeah, let's. Uh... Let's continue in ML book actually. Um, why? Why not? So we can take that there and we can open ML book. We're going to have to set conceal level to zero. All right. And let's say a section uh, pattern recognition. Mm-hmm. All right, so labels may have changed, sure. Okay. So I think we can get started. Um, so let's first, so it's always a good idea to kind of Always a good idea is to get like um, like a general big overview. So we have the preface, we have the notation. All right, let's. Uh, uh, um, okay, sure. So the contents, like let's let's have a look at the contents and what we are gonna do and what we're not gonna do. So first, we have an introduction, which is uh, mm, we'll get through it. It's sixty pages. Um, then we have probability distributions, which maybe the kernel density estimator is something I need to re re review again. But this is pure statistics. I mean, probably I'll go through it just for the sake of it. Then we have linear regression, which I have a lot of experience with. Um, and then we have linear models for classifications. Then and then only then in chapter five, we get neural networks. So feed forward network functions. Then we have Gaussian processes, which I'm not sure what they are actually. The Nadaraya Watson model, I've read that before. 
So sparse kernel machines, we kind of we kind of move into the uh, kind of move into the SVM um, Vapnik SVM kind of stuff. Then we have graphical models. Then we have mixture models and expectation minimization, which is a very important algorithm. Then we have variational uh, inference, and I want to see variational autoencoders, but I haven't seen them yet. Sampling methods, continuous latent spaces. Okay, okay, okay. Sequential data, combining models. So that's actually it. It's actually not that much. Uh, personally, I am most interested in the neural network. Uh, in the neural network part. So that is chapter five. That's chapter five. And that's about, uh, let's see, two... 225 to uh, 284. So there's roughly 60 pages on neural networks. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's get started, shall we? So um, I kind of want to immediately dive into chapter five, which is probably a bad idea, but let's see. So let's just start at chapter five. I'm gonna zoom out a bit. All right. Um, so, uh, excuse me. So, in chapter three and four, we considered models for regression and classification that comprised uh, a linear combination of fixed basis functions. We saw that such models have useful analytical and computational properties, but that their applicability was limited by cursive dimensionality. In order to apply such large models, uh, such such models to large scale problems, it's necessary to adapt the data function, the basis function to the data. So, sorry, uh, support vector machines are discussed in chapter seven. All right, all right, all right. Um, okay, so one advantage of SVMs, sure. Here, an alternative approach is to fix the number of basis functions in advance but allow them to be adaptive. In other words, use parametric forms for the basis functions in which the parameter values are adapted during training. The most successful model of this is uh, the feed-forward neural network known as the multilayer perceptron. So uh, we can write it down. So um, the um, feed a feed-forward neural network is the same as the as a multi-layer perceptron. So this is chapter five. Actually, uh, a multi-layer perceptron is a misnomer because the model comprises multiple layers of logistic models with continuous non-linearities rather than multiple perceptrons with this discontinuous non-linearities. The price to pay for this compactness is that the likelihood function, which forms the basis, is no longer a convex function. So the likelihood is no longer a convex function. <laughs> um, so the likelihood is no longer convex. Uh, yeah, that's probably uh, likelihood is no longer convex. Um, the term neural network has its origins in attempts to ma find mathematical representations of information processing and biological systems. So these are the uh, neural networks. So, Rosenblatt. So let's, the term neural network has its origins in finding, um, yeah. Indeed, it has been uh, used uh, wide exaggerated claims, blah, blah, blah. Uh, our focus in this chapter is on neural networks as efficient models for statistical pattern recognition. We shall restrict our attention to the specific class of neural networks that have proven 
of greatest practical value. So we have to take into account that this mo- this book was written in 2006. So deep learning was not a thing yet. Uh, we begin by considering specific parameterizations, network parameters within the likely maximum likelihood framework. Okay, this requires evaluation of derivatives uh, with respect to the network parameters uh, using error backpropagation. Backpropagation shall be extended to l- allow other derivatives a regularization. <sighs> uh, mixture density networks. Uh, that's interesting. So he already worked on this. Since nineteen uh, ninety five, so okay, we're gonna have to write this down. So linear models for regression and classification, respectively, are based on a linear combination of fixed nonlinear basic f- basis functions. So phi j x is a basis function. So let's let's write that down. So um, so a basis function phi j x. then linear models respectively are based on a combination okay so so in general like we have linear model for regression which is um y x w equals f sum j is one through m so we have m combinations w j phi j x where phi j x are basis functions um f is a nonlinear active vision function Uh, not in the classification, uh, or the identity in regression. Our goal is to extend this model by making the basis functions depend on the parameters and allow these parameters to be adjusted along with the coefficients. So coefficients. During training, there are many ways. Neural networks use the same form such that each basis function itself is a nonlinear function of the linear combination of the input. So this leads to the basic neural net model, which can be described as a series of functional transforms. So that's another interesting thing. So like the basic neural network model can be seen as a series of functional transformations of the data. So I'm just gonna copy this ad verbatim. So this is straight from the book. So first we construct M linear combinations of the inputs, input variables, x1 through xd, aj equals sum i equals 1 to d w j i uh, 1 x i plus w j naught uh, 1 so let's see what this means exactly this is for uh, for j's 1 through m so these are all the M hidden nodes, right? So we have M hidden nodes. So um, maybe I should maybe I should draw this. Um, Hmm. <laughs> 
First, we construct m linear combinations of the input variables um, uh, where m denotes the amount of hidden. Uh, no, wait, what does m denote? Um, where m denotes the amount of hidden nodes in the first hidden layer, right? So, I want to draw this actually. Um, mm -hmm. And then the superscript indicates that the parameters in the first layer of the network. Um, yeah, we're gonna have to note that. Um, so the superscript uh, denotes the parameters of the first layer. Then we denote the parameters W, J, I, one as the weights and W, J, naught. Uh, as the biases then um, the quantities like um, AJ are called the activations And then in the end, we transform the activations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that each of them is then transformed using a differentiable nonlinear activation function H. So these quantity correspond to the outputs of the basic functions, basis function 5.1 that uh, are called hidden units. The nonlinear functions in general are chosen to be sigmoidal functions such as the logistic one or the 10H function. So um, in deep learning models, this is not true anymore. They just use like uh, ReLU now, right? Mainly a ReLU uh, functions. So ZJ equals HAJ uh, where uh, HC dot is the nonlinear activation function. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, example exercise following these values again are linearly combined to give output unit activation functions. So, now you see that we have a Z here, right? And we have a Z here. Um, the transformation corresponds to the second layer of the network. And then Mm hmm oh yeah this is a nice um this is a nice image i'm not sure what the x here is um yeah probably the bias node Okay, um, and thus for standard regression problems, the activation function is the identity, right, at the end. For multiple binary classification problems, each output unit, uh, or for multi-class, for so, for multiple binary classification problems, each output unit is transformed using a logistic function, so you get a probability between um, one and minus um, zero and one. Otherwise, we can have a softmax. So we can combine these various stages to give the overall network function for a sigmoidal. Yeah. Okay. So. It's just a big function, right? Where the set of weights and bias into the vector W. 
Thus, the neural networking model is simply a nonlinear function from a set of input variables to a set of output variables. So this is this is kind of uh, the key to remember here. So. So, thus the neural network is simply a nonlinear function from a set of input variables to a set of output variables controlled by a vector w of adjustable parameters. Awesome. Uh, this function can be represented in the form of a network or as shown in figure 5.1. The process of, of evaluating, um, so feed forward propagation is just uh, evaluating, right? It's just uh, putting the data um, The bias parameters can be absorbed into the set of weights by defining an additional input variable x naught, right? So, um, uh, so how do we include the so the bias bias parameters can be absorbed uh, by defining an additional input variable. So this is basically the constant, right? This is almost like the constant in a, in a uh, linear regression model. It's just a bias variable. Very interesting. Then similarly, we can absorb the second layer biases into the second layer weight so that the overall function, so you stack this. Um, I'm just scrolling through it real quick. How much stuff we have to do. Um, exact evaluation. Mm. This all seems to become relatively difficult. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, so... Um, we were left at the here. All right, so um, so then we can absorb. Um, we can uh, absorb the bias into the into the weight uh, vector. So we get this. So I'm just gonna write this down. Um, Mm, do we want to write it down? Are we going to use it further on? Um, okay, so let's just continue reading. Um, as can be seen from 5.1, the model comprises of two stages, each of which resembles the perceptron in 4.1.7, which we didn't discuss at all. Uh, and because of this reason, the neural network is known as the multi-layer perceptron. Um, the key difference is that the neural network uses continuous sigmoidal nonlinearities Whereas the perceptron uses step function nonlinearity. So this means that the neural network is differentiable with respect to the parameters. And this and this plays a, uh, a central role in the network uh, training. So this is actually really important uh, because you can then, uh, uh, because you, we can take derivatives uh, using the chain rule, right? But um, at the same point, if you use like nonlinear activation functions, that might not be true anymore. So um if the activation functions of all the hidden networks uh, uh of all the hidden units in the network are taken to be linear then for any such network we can always find an equivalent network without hidden units this follows from the fact that successive linear transformations are linear um okay this is not too interesting 
However, it is easily generalized. So this is a two layer one, a two layer neural network, and we can just add more weights to that. Um, so counting, so thus the network in 5.1 is described as a three layer network. One, two, three. I would say it's a one hidden layer network, but um, or sometimes a single hidden layer because it counts numbers that we recommended. Where it's called the two layers, it's not, it's not, it's not one, it's not two, but it's, uh, it's two here because of the number uh, of layers of adaptive weights that is important. Okay. Oh, skip layer connection. All right. Um, I think they should add dropout should be in here as well, uh, which we will learn. Okay, so because there is a direct correspondence between a network diagram and its mathematical function, we can develop more general net network mappings by considering more uh, complex diagrams. However, these must be uh, restricted to a feed forward architecture. So feed forward. So I'm going to write this down actually. So what does the feed forward mean? So uh, feed forward, feed for a hey, just me, bro. What's up, man? Feed forward architecture uh, means that there are no closed directed cycles, which ensures that the outputs are determinist deterministic functions of the inputs. So if you input the same thing, you always get back the same thing, right? That to me is not biologically plausible because neurons can get tired from doing the same thing over and over again, right? So people get tired. This illustrated uh, is illustrated uh, with a simple example in figure 5.2. So each hidden unit uh, computes a function given by... No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. Um... Approximation properties, what are we doing today? Today we're reading a book. <laughs> I was thinking of uh, just going through this book. This book is already quite outdated. Um, so let me go back to super work real quick. Um, so uh, we're reading a book and we were read planning on reading one page, but we already did one page. So we're just going to see how far we can get. Um, I was thinking of getting kind of more of a mathematical uh, background about neural networks, but I think I might, I don't want to say stop early, but I'm not too sure if I'm actually interested in reading this book <laughs> because it, it, it touches a lot on the math, but I'm actually more interested in kind of the applications. Uh, so I might just, um, I might just start working again on the visualization of the neural network where we did this thing, right? Uh, no, wait a second. Uh, didn't I save it? Uh, this thing? Yeah. Uh, or we're going to do that. Uh, I'm sorry. So, anyway, let's continue. Uh, so, feed forward means that there are no closed cycles. Um, here, the approximation properties of feed-forward networks have been widely studied. Uh, Sibenko, 1989. That's the paper I was talking about, right? That's the paper I was uh, thinking about reading with you. Um, because uh, that paper touches upon the approximation function. Uh, like, So this paper mathematically shows why neural networks work the way they do and why they work so well. Um, oops. Uh, yeah. Um, and found to be very general. So neural networks are therefore said to be uh, universal approximators. So for example, a two layer network with linear inputs can uniformly approximate, which is really strong, any continuous function on a compact input domain, compact means closed and bounded, uh, to arbitrary accuracy provided it has a sufficiently large number of hidden units so if we just stack enough hidden units um you can approximate basically any function um this result holds for a wide range of hidden activation units but excluding polynomials although such theorems are reassuring the key problem is how to find suitable parameter values 
given a training set and in later sections we show that there exists effective solutions so both from a maximum likely perspective and the Bayesian approach okay um, so this shows uh, four different functions that are approximated using neural networks which is really cool actually mm -hmm. yeah this is pretty cool as well this also shows how uh how a neural network can approximate functions okay so um weight space symmetry so one property of feed forward networks um consider a two layer if we change this okay so now here if we change the sign of all the weights and the biases then for a given input pattern the sign activation will be reversed because 10 h is an odd function mm, 10 h minus a is minus 10 h this transformation is exactly compensated by changing the sign of all the weights thus by changing the signs of the weights of a particular group the input output mapping represented is unchanged so we have found two different weight vectors that give rise to the same mapping functions m uh, for m hidden units there will be m such sign flips symmetry such as any given weight will be one of us uh, of like a power set uh, of equivalent weight factors so um similarly imagine we interchange the value of all the weights and the biases leading both in and out of a particular hidden unit with corresponding values and weights other than that again this clearly leaves the network unchanged but it corresponds to a different choice of weight vector Okay, therefore the network will have an overall weight space symmetry of factor m factorial 2 to the power of m, which is a lot. So for m is like, uh, yeah, that's a big number. Uh, for networks for more than two layers of weights, the total symmetry will be given by the product of such factors, one for each hidden unit. So it turns out that these factors account for all the symmetries in the weight space. Furthermore, the existence is not a particular property of the 10h function. But applies to a wide range of functions. So I think functions that are in general odd. Uh, in many cases, these symmetries in the weight space are of little practical practical uh, consequence. Uh, in section 5.7, we will encounter one in which we will have to take them into account. So that's uh, chapter 5.1, uh, which actually is already. Uh, let's see. We uh, we did a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight eight pages. So we already did eight pages, actually. Um, and we basically learned what neural networks are uh, again. But, um, yes, yeah, so I wonder how much time I have left. I have 12 minutes left. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I think I might just I don't I don't I don't want to say stop reading, but I might uh, start working again on the um, neural network visualization. Okay, so um, I'm gonna quickly fill in my super work because we've been uh, streaming for uh, let's say forty almost forty minutes now. I think it's more like half an hour, but um, I need a coffee actually, so I'm gonna take a very quick break. I hope you guys don't mind. So it's fourteen. 8 right now so uh, make a LaTeX file and read the first page we did that so we can have a yes here uh, what did you do to cycle so we actually uh, read 10 pages no 8 pages of Bishop we read chapter 5 point uh, we read the introduction of uh, chapter 5 and we uh, did um, 5.1 any instructions? No. Text to improve? Tell me. Co maybe maybe it's a fun idea to do like uh, kind of like a fast AI. The fast AI is like an AI course thing, right? Maybe we should do that. All courses are free and have no ads. Practical deep learning for coders. Hmm. Hmm. Making neural nets uncool again. Harvard Business Review. Fast AI can get motivated. Industrial grade ML deployment. That's cool. Seven week course taught by Jeremy Howard. 
Who is Jeremy Howard? Isn't he... Um, look up Jeremy Howard. American actor. That's wrong. Uh, without needing graduate level math. But also without... It's totally free. Should we do this? Is that a fun idea? Maybe it's a fun exercise. I think it's more fun to do this course together than to uh, than to read a book together. In all honesty. Uh, all right. So how does this work? Okay. First. Um, okay. We're gonna we're gonna check out. Uh, we're definitely gonna check out fast AI. Okay. Okay. Check out. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a coffee. I hope you guys are willing to stick with me. Uh, thank you so much for joining me uh, today, and um, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna leave this open so you guys can see uh, okay, that we're gonna do fast AI, uh, something like this. All right, I'll be back in a jiffy, guys. All right. So, um, I think I'm gonna change the. I should put like fast AI, part one. Um. Yeah. So let's um. Let's do some fast AI, I guess. Uh uh uh. uh let me see. Live dashboard. 
Okay, so I am kind of tired, so you guys have to help me with uh, all the programming stuff. Um, so, uh, welcome to the seven a week course. Learn how to build state of the art models. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So, 10 hours a week for seven weeks. So, that's 70. All right. So, all right. Let's. So, this is week one, right? Um, so, let's uh, make a new project, actually. So, let's just rename this to Fast AI. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, recognizing cats and dogs, I guess. Click the square on the bottom of the right to view full screen. Hmm. Holy shit, it's actually, uh, It's uh, like a one hour thirty. Jeez. Um, so welcome to the start. You'll set up a deep learning server. You'll train your first image classification in CNN, which will learn to distinguish cats from dogs. If you need help, head over to the forums. Each lesson contains a link in the forum. It includes a hyperlink timeline. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, important. You need an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, you no longer need to set up server from scratch. Don't use Ubuntu, but use public templates and then fast AI. So this is the instructions. Okay. Uh, you're not expected to understand the code, but we are going to try. Uh, don't worry. By the end of the course, not only every line, but you'll be able to write the underlying network. Just focus on being able to run the code and understand the inputs and outputs. So... I think you need to go back to your PC gamer. Uh, yeah, but this is like paper space, right? Or is paper space... Isn't that a, like an online GPU? Create mm -mm -mm -mm. count... Storage. <laughs> okay. So you need to pay for the course? You need to pay for this stuff? Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to be... Um, Alright, we're, we're going to do it anyway. You're not expected... To, okay, so uh, you'll learn to classify dogs from cats rather than understanding the mathematical details starting uh, using fine-tuning. Um, okay, this is cool. Learn how the data is structured. If your data is not structured, you won't be able to train any models. So... Um, I'm pretty confident you guys can't hear the sound. Presenting this from the Data Institute in San Francisco. Um, we'll be doing seven lessons in this part of the course. Uh, most of them will be about a couple of hours long. This first one may be a little bit shorter. Is the audio fine? All right, then. Maybe I'm going to watch it on two times speed. I hate slow videos, but. Um, practical deep learning for coders is all about getting you up and running with deep learning in practice, uh, getting world class results. Um, and it's a really coding focused approach, uh, as the name suggests. So oh, we're not he's up there. At the end of the course, you'll have learned all of the theory and details that are necessary to rebuild uh, all of the world class results we're learning about from scratch. I should mention, 
that our videos are hosted on YouTube, um, but we strongly recommend watching them via our website at force.fun.ai. Um, although they're exactly the same videos, the uh, important thing about watching them through our website is that you'll get all of the information you need about kind of updates to libraries, file locations, uh, further information, frequently asked questions, and so forth. So if you're currently on YouTube watching this, um, why don't you switch over to force.fun.ai now and start watching through there, and make sure you read all the material on the page before you start, just to make sure that you've got everything you need. The other thing to mention is that there is a really great strong community at forums.fast.ai. Um, from time to time, you'll find that you get stuck. Um, you may get stuck very early on, you may not get stuck for quite a while, but at some point you might get stuck with understanding um, why something works the way it does, or there may be some computer problem that you have, and so forth. Uh, on forums.fast.ai, there are thousands of other learners talking about every lesson and lots of other topics besides. It's the most active big learning community on the internet by far, so definitely register there uh, and start getting involved. You'll get a lot more out of this course if you do that. So we're going to start by doing some coding. Uh, this is an approach we're going to be talking about in a moment called uh, the top-down approach to study, um, but let's learn it by doing it. So let's go ahead and try and actually train a neural network. Now, in order to train a neural network, you almost certainly want a GPU. GPU is a graphics, pro processing, a graphics processing unit. Um, it's the thing that uh, companies use to help you play games better. Um, uh, they let your computer render the game much more quickly than your CPU can. We'll be talking about them more shortly, but for now, uh, I'm going to show you how you can get access to a GPU. Um, specifically, um, you're going to need an NVIDIA GPU, because only NVIDIA GPUs support something called CUDA. Uh, CUDA is the language and framework that nearly all deep learning uh, libraries uh, and practitioners use to do their work. Um, obviously, it's not ideal that we're stuck with one particular vendor's cards, and over time, we hope to see more competition in this space, but for now, we do need an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, your laptop almost certainly doesn't have one, unless you specifically went out of your way to buy like a gaming laptop. Um, so almost certainly you will need to rent one. Uh, the good news is that renting access, uh, paying by the second for a GPU-based computer is uh, pretty easy and pretty cheap. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of options. Um, the first option I'll show you, which is probably the easiest, is called Cressel. Um, if you go to Cressel.com and click on sign up, or if you've been there before, sign in, um, you will find yourself at this screen, which has a big button that says Start Jupiter, and another switch called Enable GPU. So if we make sure that is set to true, Enable GPU is on, and we click Start Jupiter, and we click Start Jupiter, it's going to launch us into something called Jupiter Notebook. Jupiter Notebook, in a recent survey of tens of thousands of data scientists, was rated as the third most important tool in the data scientist's toolbox. It's really important that you get to learn well, and all of our courses will be run through Jupiter. Yes, Rachel, you have a question or a comment? Oh, I just wanted to point out that you get t like 10 free hours, um, so if you wanted to try Cressel out, um, you're not having yeah. to, to pay right away. Yeah. I, he might have changed that recently in less hours, but you can check the fact or the price, but you certainly get some free hours. Um, the pricing varies because this is actually runs on top of Amazon Web Services, so at the moment it's 60 cents an hour. Um, the nice thing is, though, that you can always turn it, turn it on, you know, start with Jupyter without, without the GPU running and pay you a tenth of that price, which is pretty cool. Does anyone know if there's, like, uh, are there, like, written notes? Because I don't want to watch a two-hour video. I mean, I wouldn't mind, but aren't there, like, click... So this is second lesson. So the lesson is like, this is lesson two already, and there are seven lessons, right? Hmm. Hmm. My computer is having a very hard time with this. Hmm. Okay, so let's try and set up uh, new messages. Go away. I don't want to talk to Intercom. <laughs> hey, overly sarcastic. Two hour videos are only one hour if you watch it at two times speed. Yeah, like I should fix the audio so you guys have clearer audio because I don't know how to fix my desktop audio uh, so you guys can hear it. It's like a Mac, uh, like a Mac thing. Um that the audio doesn't work immediately. Um, so let's try and set up this paper space thing then, I guess. Uh, correspond to the first 12 minutes. Uh, so these dates, okay, so paper space, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's make an account here. Let's become deep learners, guys. We're gonna make the dankest memes with deep learning. Paper space. 
account sign up. Please don't, please don't ask for my credit card address immediately. Okay, so. Am I a robot? Maybe, maybe not. This is so slow. Oh my God. I'm not a robot. Okay, I'm quickly gonna, I just got an email I think on my phone. Please confirm your email. All right, I will. Please click this link. But is the audio annoying for you guys or can I play the audio on the video? Or like you guys don't mind. I think I can put the mic to bi-directional so you get maybe a better... Uh, I can try and put it to bi-directional. All right, uh, so we can sign in now. Let's sign in. Okay, so we did that. Um, reference. There's a $15 code you can use. Okay. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. So, um, <laughs> no, no, I don't want that. Um, uh, where do we go? Um, my computer is having a very hard time with it, with keeping up. Okay. Creating a machine. So, Click this link. Oops. Create new machine. Choose region. Choose template. All right, so we can do that. If uh, if my computer decides to cooperate, we can we can definitely do this. Um, but does like are there any just the fast AI course? That's the video. So one hour thirty minute video. That's the whole first lesson. Error. It looks like you don't have a credit card on the line. I know. I'm kind of scared of like putting in my credit card. Do you think they can like? Um, This website, you think I could use a collab? Uh, let me Google that. This website is either really slow or my computer is really slow or both. I think it's honestly the website, but let's Google this. Fast AI with Google Collab. Part one, due to personal reasons, I'm not able to create an account through Paperspace or any other cloud platforms. I think it's my, uh, oh, there we are. I successfully completed part one using Google Colab. It took a little fiddling around, but Change runtime to Python 3. When runtime is connected, add this piece of code to the top. Run it. The rest of the should be fine. So fast AI install. Pip install fast AI. Import CV2. Import OS path uh, from wheel accelerator. 
All right, let's try and do it with um uh, probably we should be able to use collab. Okay, so let's continue with the tutorial. Um he's probably going to talk to us about uh stuff. Stop being so slow, computer. Uh, come on. Presenting this from the Data Institute. Uh, can I put this to like three uh, like we'll be doing seven lessons in this type of course. Uh, most of them will be about a couple of hours long. But the way it does, or there may be some computer problem that you have, also of course. Uh, on forums like Master AI there are thousands of other learners talking about every lesson and lots of other topics besides. It's the most active people in the community on the internet by far. So definitely register there uh, and start getting involved with everyone. Okay, so go to the forums if you need help. Oh my god, listening at something at two point speed requires you to actually like really pay close attention to what he's saying. I can follow it, but it takes so much. It's a developed uh, skill. Once that you do it, everyone starts sounding really slow. I know, but maybe you guys think it's annoying when I when I listen to something at two at like two times speed. Okay, now we're going to paper space. How is his internet so fast when he's streaming? Oh my god! Oh, he's using a Windows machine. That's pretty awesome. And then I'll say Linux. And I'll say Ubuntu 16. And then it says choose machine. And you can see there's various different machines I can choose from uh, and pay by the hour. So this is pretty cool. For 40 cents an hour, so cheaper than Cressel, I get a machine that's actually going to be much faster than Cressel 60 cent an hour machine. Or for 65 cents an hour, way, way, way faster. Right? Crazy, so, huh? Um, I'm going to actually show you how to get started with, with, with the paper space approach um, because that actually is going to sh do everything from scratch. You may find if you try to do the 65 cents an hour one that it may require you to contact Paperspace to say, like, why do you want it? This is an anti fraud thing. So if you say faster AI there, um, then they'll quickly get you off of it. So I'm going to use the cheapest one here, 40 cents an hour. Um, <coughs> you can pick how much storage you want. Um, and note that you pay for a month of storage as soon as you start the machine up, right? So don't start and stop lots of machines because each time you pay for that month of storage. Um, I think the 250 gigs, $7 a month option is pretty good. Um, but you only need 50 gigs. So if you're trying to minimize the price, you can do that. Um, the only other thing you need to do is turn on public IP so that we can actually log into this and we can turn off auto snapshot to save the money of not having backups. Right, so if you then click on create your paper space. But like, if you, if you create the paper space, right, it's per hour, but only when you're running stuff, right? When you're not running anything, you're not paying. I, I definitely hope no, not. Uh, you will find that your machine will pop up. Off, on, ready. That's pretty cool. So now we need to configure this for the course. And 
so the way you configure it, of course, is you type curl <laughs> are we gonna type the whole command? Yes, we are. Type the whole URL. Okay, and so that's then gonna run a script which is gonna set up uh, all of the trigger drivers, um, the special Python uh, repo, uh, Python uh, distribution we use for Anaconda, uh, all of the libraries, all of the courses, um, and the data we use for the first part of the course. Okay. So that takes uh, an hour or so. It takes an hour to set up. You'll need to reboot your computer. Uh, so to reboot, not your own computer, but your database computer. Oh my god, when is this gonna get interesting? Of course, this is like... I don't want to say interesting, but... Can I, can I, can I continue? <sighs> Alright, so make sure that you CD into fast AI and then you can type Jupyter Notebook. Which opens a new notebook, right? Alright, there it is. So we now have a Jupyter Notebook server running and we want to connect to that. Right? And so you can see here it says copy paste this URL into your browser and you connect. So if you double click on it, um, then that will actually um, uh, that will actually copy it for you. Then you can go and paste it. Um, but you need to change this localhost um, to be the paper space IP address. So if you click on the little arrows to go smaller, you can see the IP address is here. So let's copy that and paste it where it used to say localhost. Okay, so it's now HTTP and then my IP and then everything else I copied before. And so there it is. So this is the fastai uh, Git repo. Okay, that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. And in there, the deep learning part one is the L1. And in there, you will find lesson one dot ipy and then ipy the notebook. But these are just notebooks. Is it, has anyone done this before? Is it gonna stay at the same tempo? Like, like what's the, is it, is it gonna speed up? Um, oh, I don't wanna say, okay, I don't wanna say, um, like, is this one and a half hour of. Okay, so we have to realize that this is one week's worth of, uh, of, of, of stuff, right? So we're supposed to do this in one week, I guess. Or 10, 10 hours. Okay, import, import everything. I'm going to check that out in a second, just me, bro. Thanks, Rachel. Um, now, it mentions here that you can download the data set for this lesson from this location. Um, uh, if you're using Cressel or the Pegaspace script that we just used to set up, it'll just already be made available for you. Okay? If you're not, you'll need to double data first. So. Now, Cressel is um, quite a bit slower than Pegaspace, and also it um, there are some particular things it doesn't support that we really need, and so there, there are a couple of extra steps if you're using Cressel. You have to run two more cells. Right? So you can see these are commented out, they've got hashes at the start. So if you remove the hashes from these and run these two additional cells, that just runs the stuff that, the stuff that you only need for Cressel. I'm using paper space, so I'm not going to run it. Okay, so inside our um, data, so we set up this uh, path to data slash docs cats that's uh, pre set up for you. And so inside there, you can see here I can use an exclamation mark um, to um, uh, basically say I don't want to run Python, but I want to run bash, I don't want to run shell. So this runs a, a bash command, and the bit inside the curly brackets uh, actually refers Canva to a Python variable. Sets that Python variable into the bash command. So here's the contents of our folder. There's a training set and a validation set. 
if you're not familiar with the idea of training sets and validation sets, um, it would be a very good idea to check out our practical machine learning course, um, which tells you a lot about this kind of stuff, but the basics of how to set up and run machine learning projects more generally. Would you recommend that people take that course before this one? Or? Actually, a lot of students do would, you know, think through these mm. So you can kind of check it out and, and see. Um, the machine learning course, um, yeah, they cover some similar stuff, but all in different directions. So people have done both, seems, you know, say they find that they, they each support each other. Um, I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite, um, but you know, if, I do, if I say something like, hey, this is a training set and this is a validation set, and you're going, I don't know what that means, at least Google it, do a quick read, you know, because we're assuming that you know the very basics of, of kind of what machine learning is and does to some extent. And I have a whole blog post on this topic as well. Okay, and we'll make sure that we mention that in course.fast.ai. And I also just wanted to say, in general with Fast.ai, our philosophy is to, to learn things on an as-needed basis. Yeah, exactly. Don't try and learn everything that you think you might need first, otherwise we're going to get down to learning the stuff you actually want to learn. Exactly. And that's something deep learning, I think, particularly a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Learn as you need, right? There's a cat's folder and a dog's folder, and then inside the validation cat's folder is a whole bunch of JPEGs. Um, the reason it's set up like this is that this is kind of the most common standard approach for how um, image classification data sets are shared and divided. And the idea is that each folder tells you the label. So there's each of these images. Okay, so each folder tells you the label. Let's. I kind of want to write that down. I kind of want to write down how they. Uh, so let's make a new. Uh, let's make a new section here. Uh, fast AI. And then make a new subsection, week one. So, um, I either set up a uh, paper space or a uh, Cressel or a collab, which is probably but this requires more fiddling. All right, so we're already almost 20 minutes in. Label with cats and each of the images of the dogs folder is labeled with dogs. Okay. Uh, this is how Keras works as well, for example. Um, <coughs> so this is a pretty standard way to share um, image classification um, files. So we can have a look. Oh my God, so cute. So Like, wait, wait, it's a Python 3.6 format string. So we have an F format path where path is a variable, and then we have files not. Mm, which is also in between. Okay, so you can just like. So this is a Python 3.6 format string, and you can just put variables in between uh, curly braces. That's That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, it's an image whose shape, that is the dimensions of the array, is 198 by 179 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, Wait, array, it's, it's called a what? It's called a rank 3 tensor. Uh, a what? It's called... Uh, so we have... Uh, we have XYZ... It's called a rank three tensor. What is this? Is just jargon. This is just technical terms that are not too difficult. But uh, so rank three tensor. So some words are confuse me. A tensor rank. No wait. So it's just X Y Z, right? So what's the difference between a matrix and a tensor? First four rows and four columns of that image. So as you can see, each of those uh, cells has three uh, items in it, and it's just a red, green, and blue pixel values between 0 and 255. So here's a little subset of what a picture actually looks like inside the folder. Uh -huh. So that's... That's what we are so one 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 quick note. So, um, 
you know what's funny is that if you translate like the image right if you have the image of a cat and you translate it like five pixels to the right in our human eye it still is exactly the same picture in terms of data it's like offset by five pixels but it's now a completely different picture right and i think that's really kind of something that algorithms should be robust to right i think they do that with um where you crop uh, where you randomly crop, where you randomly rescale, where you randomly pick a subset of the data. But, I mean, for our eyes, it doesn't matter whether a picture is translated one or two pixels to the left or the right. But for a machine learning algorithm, it is. So I think that's a current weakness of the algorithms that we use right now. Or rather, the representations. Okay, so it's pretty cool, right? So this is this is your, like, we can debate whether uh, whether what we're doing is correct in in a biological sense, but if it works, it works. So we give the computer a lot of images of cats, we give the computer a lot of images of dogs, and then it finds statistical regularities in the data, and it is able to predict almost perfectly whether something is a cat or a dog. So whether the computer understands if it's a cat or a dog, we don't really care that much. Of course, if we're talking about AGI, if we're talking about like artificial general intelligence, then we start caring whether the computer understands it's a cat or a dog. But if it works, it works. That's my current uh, view, at least. So. And at the point in time when this, um, this, this data has actually come to a cat Okay, we're going to use a pre trained model that is a model created by someone else to solve a different problem. Instead of building a model from scratch, we solve So uh, we do uh, ImageNet 1.2 million and 1,000 classes. It's a CNN. Uh, okay, we will all be learning about CNN. So we already learned about CNN. We will be using the ResNet 34 model. is a version that won the 2015 ImageNet competition. So what's a ResNet? We should be <laughs> RM RF pseudo. It is kind of cool that we're gonna use like. Um, a pre-trained model, right? I think that's cool. If you have a pre-trained model and then you classify other data on that and it works, that's pretty cool. Okay, we have arch equals resnet. So I think arch stands for architecture. of data is image classifier data from paths path tfms equals tfms from model where sz is probably size uh size was two to four i remember from earlier up in the notebook um uh, but uh, uh, um learn is conf learner pre-trained arch data pre-compute is true learn fit 001 and three okay That's some cool training graphic, huh? About 90, it's about 99, right? So you can see we've come a long way since 2012. And in fact, even in the competition, um, this actually would have won the Kaggle competition of that time. The best in the Kaggle competition was 98.9, and we're getting about 99%. That's pretty sick, huh? So this may surprise you that we're getting a you know, Kaggle winning as of 20, end of 2012, early 2013, um, uh, Kaggle winning image classifier in 17 seconds, um, <laughs> but, uh, and three lines of code. Um, uh, and I think that's because like a lot of people assume that deep learning takes a huge amount of time uh, and lots of resources and lots of data. Um, and as we've learned in this course, that in general isn't true. One of the ways we've made it much simpler is that this code is written on top of a library we built, uh, imaginatively called FastAI. Uh, the FastAI library is basically a library which takes all of the best practices approaches that we can find. And so each time a paper comes out, you know, we, uh, that looks interesting, we test it out. If it works well for a variety of data sets, we can figure out how to tune it. We implement it in FastAI. And so FastAI kind of curates all this stuff and packages up for you. And much of the time, most of the time, kind of automatically figures out the best way to handle things. 
Um, so the fast AI library is why we were able to do this in this 3000 code. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason that we were able to make the fast AI library work so well um, is because it in turn sits on top of something called PyTorch, um, which is... Ha! Huh. So they're using PyTorch, and you guys, you guys were hating on me for using PyTorch as well. But I guess we are... Um, I think PyTorch is from Facebook, right? Uh, I think we use PyTorch in our GAN. Uh, really flexible deep learning and machine learning and GPU computation library written by Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. He just said it. Most people are more familiar with TensorFlow. TensorFlow? Mm -hmm. Most of the top research designers out nowadays, at least the ones that I work with, have switched across to PyTorch. They switch. And they will be covering some PyTorch later in the course. Yeah, it's, I mean, one of the things that um, hopefully you'll really like about Fast AI is that it's really flexible, that you can use all these kind of curated best practices as much or as little as you want. And it's really easy to hook in at any point and write your own data organization, write your own loss function, write your own network architecture, whatever. And so we'll do all of those things in this course. So what does this model look like? Um, well, what we can do is we can... Analyzing the results, looking at pictures, as well as looking at the metrics, it's a good idea to correct uh, a few correct labels, a few incorrect labels, the most correct labels of each class, the most incorrect labels of each class, the most uncertain labels. So with the probability closest to 0.5. Ooh. So anytime you want to find something out about data, we can look inside data. Um, so we want to get predictions for our validation set. Um, and so to do that, we can call learn.predict. And so you can see here that there's 10 predictions. And what it's giving you is a prediction for dog and a prediction for cat. Now, the way PyTorch generally works, and therefore FastAI also works, is that most models return the log of the predictions rather than the probabilities themselves. We'll learn why that is later in the course. So for now, recognize that... Wait, if you do the log of the predictions then zero becomes like minus infinity. I'll try to fix the audio for the next stream, guys. So sorry. Rand by mask, rand return, np random choice where mask zero is four. I have no idea what it is. Rand by correct is correct. Return rand by mask predictions equals data value is correct. Uh, plot value with title. That's awesome. Here are some which are incorrect, right? So you can see some of these which you think are incorrect, obviously are just the you know, images that shouldn't be there at all. Um, but clearly this one, which we call a, a dog, is not at all a dog. So there are some obvious mistakes. Um, we can also take a look at um, which cats, is it the most confident are cats? Uh, which dogs are the most dog-like, the most uh, mm -hmm. confident dogs? Um, perhaps more interestingly, we can also see which cats, is it the most confident are, are actually dogs? So which ones are the most dog And same thing for the ones that dogs that it really thinks are cats. And again, some of these are just pretty weird. I mean, I guess there is a dog in there. Yes, Rachel. I was just saying, do you want to say more about uh, why you would want to look at your data? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so finally I'll just mention um, the last one we've got here is to see which ones uh, have the probability closest to 0.5. So these are the ones that the, the model knows it doesn't really know what to do with. And some of these it's not surprising. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is kind of like uh, always the first thing I do after I build a model is to try to find a way to like, visualize what it's built. Um, so we have we want to visualize what it's what is built, right? Huh. Like does anyone know like what's the structure going to be? Are they going to be like exercises? Are they going to be questions? Like I don't know, like sh should we just follow his lead? Um kind of uncertain. Yeah, that's some wrong data. But I'm also like it's also clear that this 
model has room to improve. Like, to me, that's pretty obviously a dog. But one thing I'm suspicious about here is this image is very... It's, um, it's cropped. ...and short. Um, and as we'll learn, um, the way these algorithms work is it kind of grabs a square piece at a time. Um, so this rather makes me suspicious that we're going to be using something called data augmentation that we'll learn about, learn about mm -hmm. later to handle Data augmentation, yep. But we're not building a classifier, right? Okay, so I don't want to be skeptical because the course is probably really good. But we're just using a pre-trained model, right? So... Right? I think. Mm -hmm. And again, in that case, um, the model was 100% accurate. So you can just go to Google Images if you like and download a few things of a few different classes and see see what works. And tell us on the forum um, both your successes and your failures. Okay, so uh, bottom up, learn each building block, eventually put them together. Hard to maintain motivation, hard to know the big picture. <laughs> Fast AI, get students using a neural network right away, getting results ASAP, graduate peelback layers. Yeah, that's really cool. So that's kind of what we did, uh, kind of, kind of. We built our own neural network and then we started using some pre-trained libraries, right? So, but of course you do need to peel back eventually because it says here like gradually peel back the layers. So that is something that you do need to do. But if you want to, if you want to get started, I think it's cool that you immediately get them up to speed. So it's like an onion, but we start at the bot at the top. From scratch. Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight.
uh, a world-class um, structured data analysis program, a uh, world-class language classifier, world-class recommendation system, uh, and then we've got to go back over all of them again and learn in depth about like, well, what exactly did it do and how did it work and how do we change things around and use it in different situations for, for the recommendation systems, structured data, images, and then finally back to language. So that's how it's going to work. So what that kind of means is that most students find that they tend to watch the videos two or three times. Two or three times? Shit. Listen one, two or three times, then listen two, two or three times, then listen three, three times. But like, they do the whole thing end to end, lessons one through seven, and then go back and start lesson one again. Um, that's an approach which a lot of people find when they like, go back and understand all the details, that uh, that can work pretty well. So I would say, you know, aim to get through to the end of lesson seven, um, you know, as, as quickly as you can, rather than aiming to fully understand every detail from the start. So basically the plan is that in today's lesson, you learn um, in as few lines of code as possible, with as few details as possible, how do you actually build a new classifier with deep learning to do this? So in this case, say, hey, here are some pictures of dogs as opposed to pictures of cats. Um, then we're going to learn um, how to look at different kinds of images. Uh, and particularly, we're going to look at images of, from satellites. And we're going to say for a satellite image, um, what kinds of things might you be seeing? Okay, that's pretty cool. Structured data. Uh, I'm being called. One second. Sorry for the interruption. Of course, we have to realize that we're it's actually uh, normal people working uh, working hours. <laughs> so uh, uh, <laughs> that was uh, I got called by some company to set up uh, set up a talk about something. It was nice data science stuff. Um, so sorry, I, I had to take that. Um, all right. So where were we? Uh, wait, I got totally uh, totally distracted now. So we are. Oh yeah, I pulled my. I pulled my Google Chrome to the other screen because I was maybe. Here we are, so um, so, well, well, uh, after after I got interrupted by the uh, <laughs> by the phone call, uh, I was thinking maybe we could um, maybe we could make like a, like maybe we could t turn this deep AI course, take it, and turn it into something that is free. Well, free free in the sense of that. Maybe we can make a collab notebook um, and then polish it that much that we can share it with other people. Of course, nothing like it's all their code, right? But we can still maybe, um, excuse me, maybe uh, we can make a collab notebook. Maybe that's cool. Uh, so, okay. So we, we were watching the video. 
Uh, and I kind of want to view it on YouTube because then I can... Then I can make it bigger. After that, we're going to look at language. And we're going to figure out uh, what this person um, thinks about the movie Zombie Geddon. <laughs> uh, and we'll be able to figure out how to create, just like we create image classifiers for any kind of image, we'll learn to create NLP classifiers to classify any kind of language in lots of different ways. That's cool. I actually used NLP uh, classifiers once. For my thesis, uh, I uh, I used this algorithm to extract topics, and then I looked at, oh, and then I looked at which topics were, um, uh, which topics uh, corresponded to more volatility. So, uh, we got roughly a third in, like not even more than that. So, let's write that down. So, check out Fast AI. We definitely did that. We checked out Fast AI. What has it represent? Actually, the phone was a very relevant one. Uh, how will I get started? It's not too important. If I were to finish this, not too important. It is 15.05. Um, so first off, we read eight pages of Bishop. Um, what did we do? So uh, we made a paper space account. Um, we watched the first 37 minutes of the fast AI. Uh, lesson one idea maybe make a Google collab notebook with fast AI lesson one question mark any distractions yes my phone I got called by uh, company X for position Y um, things to improve next cycle mm. oh, I fix audio on stream okay guys thank you so much uh i'm gonna take a quick break i'm gonna make some tea uh i feel better already after having that coffee i was really sluggish um so uh thank you for tuning in uh in the next session we're gonna continue with the lesson one uh and then hopefully we're we're gonna set up a google collab notebook uh and hopefully we're uh and hopefully we can read in we can start reading in the in the data and the uh, ResNet 34, right? So now I'm actually curious what the ResNet 34 architecture looks like, and it's probably just a confnet with a metric hack ton of like. Uh, just look at my link before the next session. All right, so before the next session, let's look at it now. Let's look at your link now. Thank you so much for reminding me, by the way. Part one. Lessons as Kaggle kernels. Oh shit! Yeah, so this is exactly my idea, right? So, uh, my idea, like this is what I was thinking of doing. Um, that's pretty cool. Wow, that's awesome, dude. This is amazing. Thanks for your work. That's dude. That's awesome. Yeah, so it was my idea to like kind of, um, uh to kind of do this but then in collab so maybe it, it has already been done in collab i'm pretty sure search someone has done it already in collab um fast ai huh <coughs> excuse me <coughs> uh, excuse me <coughs> Torch. <laughs> That's a cat. Awesome. Awesome. This is data augmentation, I think. Mm-hmm. This is pretty cool. What's this? Learning rate. That's... A double! <laughs> oh! Yikes. Here, um...
like ResNet 34 like my problem is that I feel like I feel like they sometimes just kind of Okay, so now I'm curious what is the PTH file? So what is a PTH file? Uh PTH file. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What is a PTH file? I think it's a, I think it's a Python PyTorch uh, model file, right? Hmm. Forty server database. What? Okay. Anyway, so uh, I'm gonna have a quick tea break. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, the next session we're gonna hopefully finish uh we have one hour left one hour times two is uh half an hour mm, i don't think we'll be able to finish but uh we can do the lesson one and then try to see how far we get with uh, setting it up as a as a collab notebook so uh thank you so much for joining in uh today i'm gonna quickly get a cup of tea so um hopefully you guys uh are gonna stick with me here so uh thank you so much for tuning in um next session will be fast ai as well so awesome all right i'll see you guys in a jiffy
Hallo. Hey. All right. So let's see. Um. Super work. Mm, watch ten minutes. I wanna watch ten minutes. Watch a bit more. How like it started? Press play. Internet phone. All right, so um, let's get rid of all of this because my computer is uh, having a bit of trouble. All right. Then we'll look at something called collaborative filtering, which is used mainly for recommendation systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be looking at this data set that shows the different people for different movies, what rating did they give it? Um, here are some of the movies. Uh, and so. Um, this is maybe an easier way to think about it, is there are lots of different users and lots of different movies, and then for each one we can look up for each user how much they like that movie. And the goal will be, of course, to predict for user movie combinations we haven't seen before, are they likely to enjoy that movie or not? Uh, and that's the really common approach used for like deciding what stuff to put on your homepage when somebody's visiting, you know, what book might they want to read or what, what film might they want to see or so forth. From there, we're going to then dip back into language a bit more um, and we're going to look at, um, actually, we're going to look at uh, the writings of Nietzsche, the philosopher. And Nietzsche. We're going to create our own Nietzsche philosophy from scratch, character by character. Uh -huh. yeah, perhaps that every life, the values of blood of intercourse, where it says this there is unscrupulous and very right sensible impulse love, is not actually Nietzsche. Um, that's actually like some character by character generated text um, that we built um, with this current neural network. Uh, and then finally, we're going to loop all the way back to computer vision again. Uh, we're going to learn how not just to recognize cats from dogs, but to actually find like where the cat is with this kind of heat map. Uh, and we're also going to learn how to write our own architectures from scratch. Um, so, this is so it's going to write their own architecture from scratch. That's pretty cool. I think we did that a bit, right? I remember the super and the con linear I think we did something very similar I personally fell into the habit of watching lectures too much and googling definitions too much without running code. At first, I thought I should read code quickly and then spend time on a theory so behind it. Hacker News! Sorry, big shout out to Hacker News. So yeah, this is kind of what he's saying, like, he's saying, okay, don't do this, but this is advice that's often given, so relearn math relearn C++ and only then start doing ML. But what he's now going to say is like, uh, I think he's now going to say, no, just start working on ML and like get excited about it. <laughs> do exactly the opposite. <laughs> Labs or 
different people bring residents or you know um, that we create the patterns based on deep learning and so forth we've done it by doing this course um, so the top-down approach works super well now one thing to mention is like we've, we've now already learned how you can actually train a world-class image classifier in 17 seconds um, well, I should mention by the way the first time you run that code um, there are two things it has to do to take more than 17 seconds one is that it downloads a pre-trained model from the internet so you'll see the first time you run it it will say downloading model so that takes a minute or two um, also the first time you run it, it pre-computes and caches um, some of the intermediate information that it needs, and that takes about a minute and a half as well. So if the first time you run it, it takes three or four minutes um, to download and pre-compute stuff, that's normal. If you run it again, you should find the next 20 seconds or so. So image classifiers, you know, you may not feel like you need to recognize cats versus dogs very often on a computer. Um, you could probably do it yourself pretty well. Um, but what's interestingly interesting is that these uh, image classification algorithms are really useful for lots and lots of things. Uh, uh, for example, um, AlphaGo, which became uh, which became the Go world champion, uh, the way it worked was to use something um, at its heart that looked almost exactly like uh, dogs versus cats image classification algorithm. Um, it looked at thousands and thousands what? of Go boards, um, and for each one there was a label saying whether that Go board ended up being uh, the winning or the losing uh, player. And so it learned uh, basically an image classification that was able to look at a Go board and figure out whether it was a good Go board or a bad Go board. Um, and that's really the, the key, most important step uh, in playing Go well is to know which which move is better. Um, uh, another example is one of our earlier students um, who actually uh, uh, got a couple of patents for this work uh, looked at any fraud. Uh, he had uh, lots of um, examples of his customers' mouse movements because they, they provided kind of uh, this uh, uh, user tracking software to help avoid fraud. And so he took the, the mouse paths, basically, of the users on his customers' websites, uh, turned them into pictures of, w of where the mouse moved and how quickly it moved, um, and then built an image classifier that took those images uh, as input and as output it was was that a fraudulent transaction or not okay that is really cool i think that is crazy like i think i i think i read something about that once um about you can you can that you can find out if someone is like lying or is committing fraud the way someone fills in a form and in my opinion that's kind of cool and it's equally part scary i guess um i mean if there's a if there's a system you can game it right for example i filled in an application today and i spent like five hours on it because i had to get some documents so it was probably open on my screen for like more than five hours um because i had to get some very old documents which i was not expecting um but the mouth like the mouse patterns and correlating them with fraud that's pretty cool that's really cool probably because if someone's frauding he he, he has like numbers or something like in in a file and he has to get, get them <coughs> so that's really cool actually so that's crazy, right? So that's just an untapped data source, like, like mouse movements, like, uh, like mouse movements are a data source, um, and not using them is kind of, yeah, I don't know. I think that's really cool. I think that's really cool. So oh and then in the in the in the go board thing, he's core, he's saying like okay so a go board is basically we can see it as a nineteen by nineteen image right, zeros and ones. So so this is how you know some of the ways you can use deep learning specifically for image recognition, and it's worth understanding that deep learning is not you know just a word that means the same thing as machine learning right like what is it that we're actually doing here? When we're doing deep learning? Wait, wait, wait. He's going to talk about the difference between... Everything is data in the end. Very true. So he's going to talk about the difference between deep learning and machine learning. And I'm going to be very... I'm going to be listening very carefully now. So let me put it actually at normal speed. Because I think this is... I'm really curious to see what his opinion is about this difference, right? So machine learning was invented by this guy. Okay, so machine learning is invented by this guy on the screen. Mainframe to play against itself lots of times 
and figure out which kinds of things led to victories and which kinds of things didn't, uh, and use that to kind of almost write its own program. Okay, so that's just reinforcement learning, right? That's what AlphaGo also did. AlphaGo just played a billion times against itself. Uh, and Arthur, Arthur Samuels actually said in 1962 that he thought that one day um, the vast majority of computer software would be written uh, using this machine learning approach rather than written by hand by writing in loops. It's not true yet. So I guess that hasn't happened yet, but it seems to be in the process of happening. Um, I think one of the reasons it didn't happen for a long time is because traditional... Wait, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and set the mic to uh, bi-directional and let me know if it's better or it's worse. Okay, so I just set it to bi-directional. example, here's something called the Computational Pathologist, or CPATH, um, from a guy called Andy Beck. Andy Beck, back when he was at Stanford, um, uh, he's now moved on uh, to uh, somewhere on the East Coast, uh, Harvard, I think. Um, and what he did was he took uh, these pathology slides of breast cancer um, biopsies, right? and he worked with lots of pathologists to come up with ideas about what kinds of... So Patterns or features might be associated with some long-term survival. So this is this is another thing I think that machine learning can have like a real good impact in is like medical imaging, right? So if uh, like computers are extremely good at pattern recognition, um, and it would be, and I think there are already algorithms that detect like that are able to take like medical imagery and give you a probability of whether there's a tumor, right? And it turns out that computers, surprise, surprise, are very good at pattern recognition. And so I think that Gary Kasparov once said that you want, like, the ultimate the ultimate combination is not just man or not, not just machine, but it's a combination of both man and machine, right? So you can make, by using technology, by using these algorithms, you can maybe save a lot more people by having the computer do the main bulk and then uh, having to come over the like the maybe cases yourself, right? So I think that deep learning has very important, like like actually important applications in uh, me medical imagery. Uh, Just Mibra asks, are you a chess player? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a chess player. Um, I used to play chess quite competitively. I was like a regional champion when I was really young. Um, but after that, I, I stopped, like, when I started high school. Um, but yeah, I still play chess online sometimes, on the chess. Um, yeah, I love chess. It's a great game. It's awesome. Ball versus, um, versus dying quickly, basically. And so he came up with these ideas, like, um, well, they came up with these ideas, like relationship between epithelial nuclear neighbors, relationship between epithelial and stromal objects, and so forth. And so they came up with all of these ideas for features. These are just a few of the hundreds that they thought of. And then lots of smart computer programmers wrote specialist algorithms to, to calculate all these different features. And then those, uh, those uh, features were passed into a logistic regression um, to predict survival. And it ended up working very well. Uh, it Chess is my life, man. You have no idea <laughs> I'm crazy about. Uh, yeah, chess is really awesome. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of smart people like chess a lot for some reason. Probably because it's perfect information. It's pure skill, right? Actually, it's also kind of psychological. I um, we need to set some game. So you you want to beat me on stream, huh? <laughs> you want to humiliate me? Nah, I'm not that good. Um, uh, I'm very bad at quick games. I'm more like a ten minute player game. Uh, I, I, I like the short games. I like the finality of them, but I'm better when I have more time to think, especially in like tactical situations. So I'm not really a slow positional player. I'm more of a high risk, high reward, uh, uh, tactics everywhere kind of player. <laughs>
This is exactly what it said right here. So um, the predictions of the algorithms were uh, way better than the pathologists. Um, so I'm wondering if we ever are going to replace doctors with AI. Because, um, uh, I mean, yeah, of course, we'll, we will never get rid of doctors because humans are very social animals and they want like... They want social interaction like this stream it's it's also a social interaction right um but at the same time like the service that doctors provide and especially general practitioners they just go down a list of questions and then they have to decide like is this person lying or is he is it not lying um yeah like at like at at this tempo we'll never get through the whole video of course many years of work to actually to build this thing right so we really want something something better and so specifically i'm going to show you something which rather than being a very specific function with all this very domain specific uh, feature engineering we're going to try and create an infinitely flexible function a function that could solve any problem, right? It would solve any problem if only you set the parameters of that function correctly. And so then we need some all-purpose way of setting the parameters of that function. And we would need that to be fast and scalable, right? Now, if we had something that had these three things, then you wouldn't need to do this incredibly time and domain knowledge intensive approach anymore. Instead, we can learn all of those things with this with this algorithm. So as you might have guessed, um, the algorithm in question is machine learning properties is called deep learning. Deep learning. Or if not an algorithm, then maybe we would call it a class of algorithms. Okay, so we're we're still on the on the on the difference between deep and machine learning, and I still don't know the difference. Let's look at each of these three things in turn. So the underlying function that deep learning uses Ooh, this is a neural network. Ooh, interesting. Let's see. Uh, input layer. Input layer bias. We have the linear combination. Wait, let me let me make this bigger. So this is a neural network, right? So we have the inputs. If my computer decides to cooperate, there we are. So we have the inputs. Then we have the have the sum. So we take the linear combination. We have the biases, we have the activation function, and we have the same thing all over again. We forward propagate, we back, uh, we we feed forward, predict, then we back propagate. That's it. The neural network. Now, the neural network Our favorite algorithm, the neural network. We already did that. Yes. Interspersed with a number of simple nonlinear layers. Nonlinear activation functions, he means. Um, and when you intersperse these layers in this way, you. Just Mibra says deep is more like training, machine learning is more like prediction. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Maybe we'll figure it out after he's done talking. Get something called the universal approximation. Universal Approximation Theorem, Cybanko 1989 and uh, Ito 1992, I think. So those were all the papers that Bishop also talked about, right? So we, we read 10 um, we read ten pages uh, this morning and it, it, it... Oh, wait, maybe I can... Maybe I can grab it, actually. So the Universal Approximation Theorem, we talked about that here, right? Exactly here, so... No, wait, not here. Uh, here. The approximation properties of the feedforward networks have been widely studied. Sabenko, 1989, Ito, 19, 1991, etc., etc. So, 
mach- like neural networks work because they are mathematically sound because they are mathematically they can handle a lot of stuff you can throw very weird things at neural networks and they will still be able to fit it that's basically the key takeaway now if my computer decides to cooperate again solve any given problem to arbitrarily close accuracy as long as you give enough hidden layers parameters. yes so it's actually provably shown to be an infinitely flexible function technically so i'm gonna be really nitpicky here it's not inf- infinitely flexible you have to stay on the unit hypercube you have to use a certain activation function it has to be on a compact subspace etc 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 so let's say under let's say air quotes uh, under suitable conditions it's infinitely flexible okay so now we need some way to fit the parameters so that this infinitely flexible neural network solves some specific problem and so the way we do that is using uh, a technique that probably most of you will have come across before at some stage called gradient descent and with gradient descent we basically say Okay, well, for the different parameters we have, uh, how, how good are they at solving my problem? And let's figure out a slightly better set of parameters and a slightly better set of parameters and basically follow down the, the surface of the loss function downwards. It's kind of like a, a, a marble going down. To find the a marble. Problem. And as you can see here, depending on... A marble. Like, my problem with this is that um, this is just functional optimization, right? You have a you have a certain function and you want to optimize it. And uh, because it's a nonlinear function, because the function is non-convex, you have to resort to like a, like a, like a numerical iterative solution. Otherwise, you would have just uh, like, yeah, hmm. yeah. I'm wondering if there's any way to take the loss function of a neural network and kind of smooth it out. Like, would it be possible to smooth that out? Because this kind of looks really hilly, right? This um, this looks really hilly. These things are called local minima. Now, interestingly, it turns out that for neural networks in particular, um, there aren't actually multiple different... Uh, local minimum. Well, you know what you, you know what would be cool if you could like if you could visualize the if you could visualize the like like this picture, right? If you could visualize this picture, but then you could turn knobs. You could turn a knob and one knob would be for example a bias. And then when you turn the knob, you 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 see the loss function and you see it like I think that would be cool, and then you can maybe drop a marble and see where it ends up. Wait, I'm gonna write that down somewhere. I'm gonna write that down. So we have a loss function, and then you have a knob which says bias, and then you turn that. Yeah, that's cool. There's basically just there's basically just one, right? Um, or to think of it another way, there are different parts of the space which are all equally good. Um, so gradient descent, therefore, turns out to be actually an excellent way to solve this problem of fitting parameters to neural networks. Okay, big big maybe or big but. Always be very skeptical about everything you hear, right? Um, so a gradient descent is a good tool, but you have to realize that you might end up in the wrong gradient. The... Uh, there might not even exist a maximum or a minimum to that function. Um, so you might end up in a local minimum or a local optimum. You might not end up in the unique one, etc., etc., etc. So, so like, 
we're gonna use gradient descent as an all-purpose parameter tuning method but it has we need to realize that it's not the be all end right so maybe we can get to a solution without gradient descent and just use your standard optimization techniques the problem is though that we need to do it in a reasonable amount of time and it's really only thanks to gpus that that's become possible huh so gpus this shows over the last few huh. years um how many Ooh, megabytes sorry. per second can you get out of a GPU, that's the red and a gig has nine, right? The CPU, that's the blue. A gigaflop. And this is on a log scale. A log so scale, you can wow. See that generally speaking, the GPUs are about 10 times faster than the CPUs. Crazy. And what's really interesting is that nowadays, not only is the Titan X about 10 times faster than the E52699 the CPU, it's also cheaper. The Titan X, um, well, actually, better uh, one to look at would be the GTX 1080i uh, GPU costs about 700 bucks. 700? Whereas the CPU, which is 10 times slower, costs over 4,000. Wow. All right. So when people always say like, um, sometimes you read in papers that like the, the, the increase and availability of computing power has enabled us to do blah, blah, blah. So that is so like this chart is what they're talking about. Just like, like the amount of gigaflops per second that you can pull off and with with only seven hundred dollars for one Titan X, and that's two thousand sixteen, right? We're already two years further in. We're already in two, two like two thousand eighteen. So that's pretty awesome. But then again, we have to make sure that we don't do any useless calculations, right? So, like. The fact that our like our brains use way less energy than 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 all the GPUs, so we might have to rethink the architecture a bit. So GPUs turn out to be able to solve these um, neural network parameter fitting problems um, incredibly quickly and also incredibly cheaply. Uh, so they've been absolutely key in bringing these three pieces together. Then there's one more piece. Fast and scalable. That these neural networks, you can intersperse multiple sets of linear and then non-linear layers. In the particular example that's drawn here, there's actually only one, what we call hidden layer, one layer in the middle. Uh -huh, one hidden layer. Something that we learned in the last few years is that these kinds of neural networks, although they do support the universal approximation theorem, they can solve any given problem arbitrarily closely, they require an exponentially increasing number of parameters to do so. So they don't actually solve the fast and scalable for even reasonable size problems. But we've since discovered that if you create add multiple hidden layers, then you get super linear scaling. So you can add uh, a few more hidden layers to get multiplicatively um, more accuracy to multiplicatively more complex problems. And that... Just add more layers is the answer. ...is where it becomes called deep learning. Okay, so deep learning, just add more layers. So deep learning means a neural network with multiple hidden layers. That's it. Deep learning is a neural network with multiple hidden layers. That's it. Nothing more. actually really amazing what happens. Um, Google started investing in deep learning in 2012. Um, they actually hired Jeffrey Hinton, who's kind of the father of deep learning. They hired Hinton, wow. And his top uh, student, Alex Krzyzewski, um, and they started trying to build a team. Um, that team became known as Google Brain. And because things with these three properties are so incredibly powerful and so incredibly it's actually really cool that like i don't want to say machine learning is a new field but it's still quite it's still quite new right there are still a lot of things that can be discovered i think that i think that we uh gans were discovered only like discovered gans were thought of only like uh 2012 right 2014 even um so that's only four years ago. 
Um, that's actually that's actually really cool that GANs are still that recent, right? So there is still a lot of stuff that we can find out, like optimization techniques, uh, like maybe even like completely different um, architectures and stuff. Um, I think that another part of why GANs are why GANs got so popular. I'm gonna set it to cardioid. One second. I think that another reason why um, GANs became so popular is that they can be easily extended uh, using other models, right? So if we are gonna think of creating a new model, we need to think about how can we make it so flexible. Uh, that we can use it with like all other models. We we're gonna have, we're gonna think about that, huh? Flexible. You can actually see over time how many projects at Google use deep learning. Uh, my graph here only goes up to a bit over a year ago, um, but it's, I know it's been continuing to grow exponentially since then as well. That's crazy. Uh, so what you see now is around Google that uh, deep learning is used in like every part of the business. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how... Note that it doesn't say Google search. Yeah, robotics research, photos, understanding, maps, image understanding, Gmail, drug discovery, apps, Android, translation, YouTube. doesn't say Google search. Hmm. We have to realize that Google does things at a scale that nobody else does, right? Google is like Google has like the perfect is like the perfect shitstorm or the per like the perfect storm to do AI and uh, machine learning because like if you have 20 data points machine learning doesn't make that much sense if you have billions and billions of data points just like Google has like Google like literally has billions of data points and images and everything then machine learning starts to make sense because you just cannot like manually do everything on your own right so I, we're, we're actually maybe falling in the trap of what the student said, right? We are watching too much lectures and we're coding too little. We can solve machine learning problems using a, an algorithm that has these properties. Um, when a big company invests heavily in actually making that happen, uh, you see this incredible growth in how much it's used. Hey, Peter. receive an email from somebody, uh, it will uh, often uh, tell you to give us some replies. So we can put the speed up again. Maybe to 2 even. 1.5. Um, that I could send for you. And so it's actually using deep learning here to read the original email and generate um, some suggested replies. Um, and so I guess it's a really great example of the kind of stuff that previously just wasn't possible. Um, another great example would be Microsoft is also a little bit more recently invested heavily in deep learning. And so now you can use Skype, you can speak into it in English and ask it uh, at the other end to translate it in real time to Chinese or Spanish and then when they talk back to you in Chinese or Spanish Skype will in real time translate it, the speech in, in their language into English speech in real time. Um, and again, it's an example of stuff which we can only do thanks to deep learning. Um, this thing is so insanely cool. You guys know that I love art, right? I think art is super awesome but like this uh, I actually tried it out and I doodled something and it was just, it was, it was awesome. Yeah, so he's saying like, um, we have to think about how deep learning can be combined with human expertise. And I think that is exactly where the power of AI lives or where the power of AI lies, like in combining human expertise with deep, deep models. And I think that's going to be the key driver for innovation and growth, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like drawing something, just sketching it out, uh, and then using a program called Neural Doodle, this is from a couple of years ago, to then say, please take that sketch and render it in the style of an artist. And so here's the picture that, that you created, rendering it as a... That's know, so picture. awesome.
So I, uh, a few years ago, decided to try this myself. Like, what would happen if I took uh, deep learning and tried to solve a really important problem? Could this computer save your life? I mean, saving lives is a pretty, it's pretty cool, right? So, pa, false positive, analytic, analytic, analytic. That's his as a company, right? Uh, false positive. Okay, we have to, of course, um, be careful because uh, you can always say that everything, you can always get a false negative rate. Um, or I'm just going to like let him continue one second. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. see this one resume screening Ooh, did you guys remember talking about that in a very very first stream i think we uh i think we touched upon that that at this current moment in time resumes well if you're in a like us if you're applying for a small company your resume probably gets seen by human but if you apply to google amazon facebook microsoft 100 percent or a very high percent chance that your resume will go through automated screening and they will like literally look for keywords like keywords like machine learning azure uh deep learning pytorch i don't know and then they will pick the pick the top five uh uh like pick the top five uh resumes they can find or something but then again this might lead to some this might lead to like a self-reinforcing loop, right? Say that students that come from I don't know Yale get into Google, uh, get into I don't know like a, like Microsoft, um, so their resumes become successful, right? And then if they become successful, then the algorithm gets updated, and resumes coming from Yale get picked more often, leading to this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, I think it's very hard to predict product failure, actually. Um, but ad optimization, yeah, that's basically Google. Like, that's basically Google, Facebook. Anything that's free, nothing is truly ever free, right? If you're not paying, you're the product. So if you're not paying for YouTube, that's because they're they're harvesting your data. You're not paying for Google. That means you're they're harvesting your data. You're not paying for Facebook. That means they are harvesting your data. Uh, question. Is your parking really in Amsterdam's work with machine learning? Mm, wait, you're going to have to rephrase that question because I don't understand it. Question. Is your parking relay in Amsterdam works with machine hmm. You mean the traffic lights? If the traffic lights use machine learning? I don't think so. I think the traffic lights just have a timer that is set off if people get on the plate. Um, I don't think public transport is using machine learning either. I don't think I don't think there's that much machine learning going on yet. Maybe actually public transport, maybe the trains are using machine learning because I know some guys that work there at the train company and they're doing pretty smart stuff. So I'm um, so mm. No, the parking. If the parking works with machine learning, I have no idea. I doubt it. But well, actually, um, they do have computer vision. So if you um, if you don't pay, uh, and you are at a spot, 
uh, and they and sometimes they come by with this with this uh, car and it has like radar and computer vision, and then they use computer vision to check all the license plates. And if your license plate is not in the register of people that has paid, you get a very big fine. So yeah, I mean that is kind of uh, that is not really AI. It's computer vision. It's not really AI. <laughs> Well, you could you you could use the you could do the number detection, right? Oh, this is cool. Wait a second. So Below each three by three block, uh, we we multiply each pixel by the corresponding entry of the kernel, and then take the sum. That sum becomes a new pixel on the image on the right. Ho hover over a pixel on either image to see how its value is computed. And so, as I briefly mentioned, the thing we created is something called a convolutional neural network, or CNN. And the key piece of convolutional neural network is the convolution. Mm -hmm. So here's a great example from a website. Um, uh, I've got the URL here. Um, it's plain visually. Uh, and the Explain Visually website um, has an example of a convolution um, kind of in practice. Over here in the bottom left is a very zoomed in picture of somebody's face. And over here on the right is an example of using a convolution on that image. So you can see here, this particular thing is obviously finding um, uh, edges, uh, the edges of his head, right? Top and bottom edges in particular. Now, how is it doing that? Well, if we look at each of these little three by three areas that it's moving at, so each three by three area of pixels, and here are the pixel values. Oh wait, let's actually write down what we have learned so far. Um, so, uh, learn as you go. Don't spend too much time uh, reading theory. Don't forget... Um, Deep learning just means more than one in a layer. That's a kind of a half joke. It's like not a real joke. It's kind of a half joke. And it's modifying each one of those three by three pixels by each one of these uh, three by three kernel values. In a convolution, this specific set of nine values is called a kernel. It doesn't have to be nine. It could be four by four or five by five or three by two or whatever. Uh, in this case, it's a three by three kernel, and in fact, deep learning nearly all of our kernels are three by three. So in this case, the kernel is one three one oh 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 minus one minus two minus one. So we take each of the um, uh, black through uh, white pixel values, and we multiply it, as you can see, each of them by the corresponding value in the kernel, and then we add them all together. And so if you do that for every three by three area, you end up with mm. the values you see over here on the right hand side. Okay, so very low values become um, black, very high values become white. And so you can see when we're at an edge where it's black at the bottom and white at the top, we're obviously going to get higher numbers over here and vice versa. Okay? So that's a convolution. So as you can see, it is a linear operation. And so based on the definition of a neural net I described before, this can be a layer in our neural network. It is a simple linear operation. And we're going to look at lots more uh, convolutions later, including building a little spreadsheet uh, that implements them ourselves. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a nonlinear layer. So a nonlinearity, as it's called, is something which takes uh, an input value and uh, turns it into some different value in a nonlinear way. And you can see this orange picture here is an example of a nonlinear function. Specifically, this is something called a sigmoid. And so a sigmoid is something that has this kind of S shape. And this is what we used to use as our nonlinearities in neural networks uh, a lot. Um, actually, nowadays, we nearly entirely use something else called a ReLU, or rectified linear unit. Um, a ReLU. Okay, I have to pronounce ReLU as ReLU, because this guy does it like ReLU. ReLU. Just a rectified linear unit, maybe even like uh, like a leaky one, right? So, so we're gonna introduce a nonlinearity, but we're gonna introduce a nonlinearity by having two linear things. So, we're gonna introduce the nonlinearity by breaking up, like by having like, like having a little bend in there. That's gonna create a nonlinearity as well. x comma zero. 
So max x comma zero simply says replace the negatives with zero. Um, regardless of whether you use a sigmoid or a ReLU or something else, uh, the key point about taking uh, this combination of a linear layer followed by a element-wise nonlinear function is that it allows us to create arbitrarily complex shapes, as you see in the bottom right. And the reason why is that, and this is all from uh, Michael Nielsen's Neural Networks and DeepLearning.com, really fantastic uh, interactive book. Um, as you change the values of your um, linear functions, um, it basically allows you to kind of like build these arbitrarily tall or thin blocks and then combine those blocks together. Um, and this is actually the essence of the universal approximation theorem. This idea that when you have a linear layer feeding into a nonlinearity, you can actually create these arbitrarily complex shapes. Hmm. So I really feel like this idea is more deeper, is deeper and so much more fundamental than I currently understand it. I personally really want to do the universal approximation theorem, uh, one of the papers. Um, but I guess this is the, and this is the key, like, like being able to build those arbitrary towers, so to speak, being able to single out a single value using a certain set of weights and biases. And I think that is like, I don't think like this guy says that Jeremy Howard says that that's the key to the universal approximation theorem. So that's interesting. Sorry for rambling so much. I know I love to ramble. And so as we discussed earlier, the basic idea is to use something called gradient descent. Uh, this is an extract from a notebook, actually, one of the fast AI um, lessons. Um, and it shows actually an example of using gradient descent to solve a simple linear regression problem. Um, but I can show you the basic idea. Um, let's say you were just, you had a simple... Um, okay, guys, remind me, next time we're going to do this at two times speed because, because this is going really slowly. And I'm apologizing for boring everyone to death. But... Um, yeah, so this is this is machine learning as well, right? Sometimes you have to watch some boring lecture. And I think he's going to explain gradient descent now. I'm going to... And so trying to find the minimum of this quadratic one. And so in order to find the minimum, you start out by randomly picking some point. Right? So we say, okay, let's pick, let's pick here. And so you go out there and you calculate the value of your quadratic at that point. So what you now want to do is try to find a slightly better point. So what you could do is you can move a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right to find out which direction is down. And what you'll find out is that moving a little bit to the left decreases the value of the function. So that looks good, right? And so, in other words, we're calculating the derivative of the function at that point. Right? So that tells you which way is down, so the gradient. And so now that we know that going to the left is down, we can take a small step in that direction to create a new point. And then we can repeat the process and say, okay, which way is down now? And we can now take another step, and another step, and another step, and another step, and another step. Okay? And each time we're getting closer and closer. So the basic approach here is to say, okay, we start, where at some point we've got some value x, which is our current get s, right? That, that times step n. So then our new guess at time step n plus 1 is just equal to our previous guess plus the derivative, right, times some small number. We want to take a small step. Learning rate. Right. small number because if we get a big number, right, then we say, okay, we know we want to go to the left. Let's jump a big long way to the left. We could go all the way over here. And we actually end up worse, right? And then do it again. Now we're even worse again, right? So, so if you have too high a step size, uh, you can actually end up with divergence, which is rather than convergence. So this number here, we're going to be talking about it a lot during this course, and we're going to be writing all this stuff out in code and scratch ourselves. But this number here is called the learning rate. Okay, so... So remember, um, it's always good to think about what, what, what we learned, right? So remember the three things that we wanted to... Uh, we, we needed to have the infinitely flexible function. We need the parameter... Uh, we need the parameter optimization. And we needed to have the uh, fast and scalable. So for the infinite, uh, infinitely flexible function, we're going to use deep neural networks. For the parameter optimization, we're going to use gradient descent. And for the infinitely fast and scalable, I don't know what we are going to use. But so gradient descent and the learning rate is something that we will have to fine tune. So fine tuning a model means tuning with like turning the knobs and pieces a bit. 
and then paying a lot of money for the, for the deep learning servers. I think two two speed is good, but it kind of stutters a bit. I mean, I can listen to it easily, but it stutters a bit. They show nine examples of little pieces of actual photos which activate that filter quite highly. Right? So you can see layer one, these, learnt, remember, these, these are learned using gradient descent. These filters are not programmed, they were learned using gradient descent. Right? So in other words, we were learning these nine numbers. Wait a second, we are learning? We're learning the filters. Let me think about that. Um, uh, huh. Yeah, so we are minimizing some loss. Um, And the kernels are just numbers, right? Because you multiply then the values, uh, you multiply the values times the pixels. So layer two then was going to take these as inputs and combine them together. And so layer two had, you know, this is like nine kind of attempts to draw one of the examples of the filters in layer two. They're pretty hard to draw. But what you can do is say for each filter, what are examples of little bits of images that activate them? And you can see by layer two, we've got basically something that's being activated nearly entirely by little bits of sunset something that's being activated by circular objects, something that's being activated by um, repeating horizontal lines, something that's being activated by corners. Right? So you can see how we're basically combining layer one features together. So if we combine those features together, again, these are all convolutional groups. Wait, I remember this. I remember someone touching upon this, that the further you go into the into the layers, like the further you go into the layers, the, the more concrete, um, the more concrete, uh, the images become like the more specific so probably if you have an infinite amount of layers imagine having a conf neural network with infinite amount of layers do you th do you then think that like the very last layers are just activated with uh, like a single uh yeah like will they completely learn one image that that actually might be an interesting experiment where you do like have an architecture where you very strongly overfit using a convolutional neural network. Interesting idea. By the third layer, it's actually learned to recognize the presence of text. Another filter has learned to recognize the presence of petals. Another filter has learned to recognize the presence of human faces. Right? So there's three layers is enough to get some pretty rich behavior. So by the time we get to layer five, we've got some But then it says like it has it it has learned to recognize human faces, but then does it understand that it are human faces or is it more like we have observed statistical regularities? If you look at the filter in the top left, it's li like it it's literally like um like a dog. I saw this interesting thing where they did the learning rate and they they like 
they dropped it down. Like they made this this kind of picture. Um, my computer is having a rough time today. So I saw this. Uh, I saw this image where they had like the learning rate and kind of went like this. It was pretty interesting. So the learning rate kind of went uh, like went up, and then it went down again. Then it shut up again, kind of like this soaring motion. It was kind of interesting. That probably also is obvious to see why you wouldn't want it to be too low. Like if you had it too low, you would take like a little step, and you'd be a little bit closer, and a little bit step, a little step, a little step, and it would take lots and lots and lots of steps, and it would take too long. So setting this number well is actually really important. And for the longest time, this was driving deep learning researchers crazy because they didn't really know a good way to set this reliably. Um, so the good news is, last year, um, a researcher came up with an approach to quite reliably set the learning rate. Unfortunately, almost nobody noticed. So almost no deep learning researchers I know about actually are aware of this approach. Um, but it's incredibly successful and it's incredibly simple. And I'll show you the idea. Right? Uh, it's built into the fast AI library that's called LR Finder, or the Learning Rate Finder. And it comes from this paper, uh, well, it was actually 2015 paper, sorry, uh, Cyclical Learning Rates for Training Neural Networks by a terrific researcher called Leslie Smith. And I'll show you Leslie's idea. Okay, this is something interesting. This is something that I haven't thought of yet myself, uh, or at least that I don't know. So this is completely new to me, the cyclic learning rate. So Leslie's idea started out with the same basic idea that we've seen before, which is if we're going to optimize something, pick some random point, take its gradient. Right? And then specifically, he said, take a tiny, tiny step. A tiny step. Is he going to talk about momentum now? Maybe, maybe not. So let's see. Let's. So we start out. We start out and we take a tiny step. Wait. So let's start out and first you take a tiny step. All right. So the gradient. Take a tiny step. Well, learning rate like ten right? And then do it again and again. But each time increase the learning rate like that one. So then we try that two e next seven, four e next seven, eight e next seven, ten e next six. Right. And so gradually. Your steps are getting bigger and bigger, right? And so you can see what's going to happen. It's going to like start doing almost nothing, right? And it's going to then suddenly the loss function is going to improve very quickly, right? But then it's going to step even further again, and then even further again, right? Let's draw the rest of that line to be clear, right? And so suddenly it's then going to shoot off and get much worse, right? So the idea then is to go back and say, okay. At what point did we see like the best improvement? So here we've got our best improvement, right? And so we'd say, okay, let's use that learning rate, right? So in other words, if we were to plot the learning rate over time, it was increasing like so, right? And so what we then want to do is we want to plot the learning rate against the loss. Right? So when I say the loss, I basically mean like how accurate is the model? How close, in this case, the loss would be how far away is the predicted prediction from the from the goal. Right? And so if we plotted the learning rate against the loss, we'd say like, okay, initially it didn't do very much. Right? Okay, wait, so wait, wait. So the idea is to start very small and then keep doubling, keep doubling the learning rate and then look at where the biggest jump where the biggest jump in terms of the learning rate against the loss was. That's pretty cool. So you got like ta 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 ta, I think. And then it suddenly improved a lot. And then it suddenly got a lot worse. So that's the basic idea. And so we'd be looking for the point where this graph is dropping quickly. Right? We're not looking for its minimum point. We're not saying like where was it the lowest, because that could actually be the point where it's just jumped too far. We want at what point was it dropping the fastest? So if you go, um, so if you oh my god, I'm getting kind of tired. Are you guys getting tired? I'm getting getting kind of tired. Okay, I'm gonna fill in this section. So f f 16, 15. Watch 10 minutes. Well, we certainly watched 10 minutes. Uh, whew, we watched uh, what is it? One minute and one hour 15. So.
uh, we did learn, we discussed uh, the difference between uh, deep and machine learning. We also discussed uh, the three core components of deep learning where these are like should be infinitely flexible parameter tuning and fast and scalable and finally we talked about cyclic uh, learning rates interesting i thought that especially the last part was quite interesting the cyclic learning rates any distractions yeah i looked at my phone a bit things to improve next cycle you guys tell me i should probably fix the audio Okay, let's, uh, oh man, I want to take a break, but at the same time, I want to finish the lecture. So I think I'm just going to finish the lecture, um, and I hope you guys don't mind. So my idea, or what I want to do is I want to finish the lecture, and then tomorrow we can get into coding. We can try and get a, like, I think we'll, we'll have to spend some time fiddling with the collab notebook. Um, but I think that it might be cool to uh, get the collab notebook working. Um. There was a reason we streamed that one time from my big PC, right? Um, I forgot why. I think because this computer was too slow. Oh yeah, I should buy um, I should buy an Ethernet cable so my internet is faster, uh, like a Thunderbolt to Ethernet. Uh, I'm gonna definitely do that today, if the store is open actually. So let me. Um, I should Google that. Okay, so. We have 10 more minutes, so let's do the, let's watch the 10, the 10 more minutes um, and see if we can learn anything new. Oh, oh. Jeez. Jeez, Louise. So we're looking for the highest learning rate we can find where the loss is still improving fairly well. Right? And so in this case, I would say 10 to the negative 2. Right? So 10 to the negative 1 is not improving. Right? 10 to the negative 3... I don't think you missed anything except for the cyclical learning uh, part, which I can explain if you want me to. But it's it's a way of finding the... We're just finishing up the first lecture. So um, it's about the cyclical learning... Uh, rate. It's a way of setting the learning rate, which is a hyperparameter that you have to tune right. Like, why do you need that actually? It feels so hacky. It feels so hacky to having to to like fiddle with the. It kind of feels to me like if it works, it's fine. Which is the um, amount of epochs. And so that number three controls how many epochs that we run. So epochs. means going through our entire data set of images and um, using each each time we do a bunch of, uh, they're called mini batches, we grab like 64 images at a time uh, and use them to try to improve the model a little bit using gradient descent, right? And using all of the images once is called one epoch. And so at the end of each epoch, we print out the accuracy. So, you, so, so an epoch means uh, using all images once. As much as possible? Yeah. What you might find happen is if you run it for too long, the accuracy will start to Starts run. overfitting? And we'll learn about that why later. It's, it's something called overfitting, right? So you can run it for a while, run lots of epochs, 
once you see a hit worse, you don't have any debuff to do that. Um, the other thing that might happen is if you've got like a really weak model or one model's lost a Vader, maybe it takes so long you don't have time, and so you just run enough debuffs to uh, uh, fit into the time you have available. So the number of debuffs you run, you know, that's a pretty easy thing to set. So there are the only two numbers that you're going to have to set. And so the so, uh, oh. this week will be to make sure that you can run not only these three lines of code on the data that I've provided, um, but to run it on a, a set of images that um, you either have on your computer or that you need get from home. Okay, so homework. So we we finally have some homework. Homework. Um, uh, get the Resonant 34 uh, working on our own data set. It means the number of event or something like that. What do you mean? You mean the you mean the you mean the epoch or the you mean the epoch or the learning rate? So the learning rate is kind of if you have the um, so imagine we have a loss function here. Hello, can I make a new layer, please? Um, so, oh, the the epic means going through all your data once. Uh, so we have like a data set full of images, right? These are all images. And then what we usually do, so imagine all oh, one square is one image. Then what we usually do is we 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 gather mini batches. We gather, we take images by by four of them, and then we uh, run them through the model, and then we update the weights. We then we run these through the model, and then we update the weights. We do this until we exhaust all the images, and once we have exhausted all the images, that's a single epoch. And then the question is, how many how many times do you run such an epoch, right? And in general you want to run it as much as you can but not too much because then your model might start overfitting Autocomplete. Press tab. All right. I did not know that. That is actually a really helpful tip. Um, I'm going to write that down. Uh, I did not know that. Shift tab. Wow, if you press shift tab twice. Okay, that is really crazy. I did not know that. That's pretty cool. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> wow, you can also press it three times. Impressive, impressive. Okay, so put two question marks. So we can press uh, shift tab thrice for pop out. Uh, we can put a uh, question, question mark. And you can see it pops up. Right? And so it's just a 
single line of code. You'll very often find in fast AI methods, like they're, they're designed to never be more than about half a string full of code, and they're often under six lines. So you can see in this case, it's what we potentially tags, so we could then get the source code for that in the same way. Okay. Um, and then that's what we want for the function for prediction of tags, so we can get the function prediction for that in the same way. And then so again, we have to remove line length. That's what it does, it gets rid of HTML data loader, gets the predictions, and then that's what we get back. Uh, so that's okay, so uh, question mark, question mark is uh, how to get source code. Wow, that's actually really helpful. I'm actually really glad that I <laughs> that we watched this together for one and a half hours. All right. Okay, that's one hour, 26 minutes, and 34 seconds. Mm, 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 mm. Don't mind my, uh, don't mind my recommended videos, such as three blue, one brown is always a good one. Chess is always a good one. Number file is nice. Uh, wow. So yeah. So um, I'm I'm not gonna. I'm not going to add another session, but so let's see. So um, that was lesson one, actually. Or was it part two? Is this part two of lesson one? No. Darknet. Carlson, the deep learner. Carlson is a very deep learner. Did you hear that he won the... He defended, right? He defended his uh, champion... Uh, his, uh, what's it called? It was the World Championships, I think. Whew! Okay, so, um, I'm really tired. I'm just gonna play Overwatch for the rest of the night, I'm afraid. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually happy that we, um, I'm actually very happy that we ended up doing fast AI instead of reading a book, because reading a book is rather boring. Um, but it is useful. Um, I'm really excited uh, to go on this journey with you guys uh, and uh, do the fast AI, AI course together. Um, I think will be it, it. It will be very enjoyable. At the same time, I think I think it will be um, very painful because we're gonna try and spend and, and and spend no money. So we're gonna try to. Uh, to do it in uh, using PyTorch and using Colab. So I might fiddle a bit off stream and try to get something working, but I can't promise I'll do that. I might do it, but I can't promise I'll do it. Uh, so yeah, so um, what did we get done today, actually? So uh, we need some coding soon, I know, man. Tomorrow, okay, tomorrow we're gonna do lesson one. We're gonna try and get the, get the Colab notebook up and running. So any other notes? Yeah, so next stream is going to be uh, trying to get a collab notebook for the fast AI um, lesson one because I think it's really cool. So when I when 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 uh, we get the collab notebook up and running, right? Well, I can share it with you guys, and I can share it with other people um, who want to do AI as well. And I think that is kind of what the stream is about. It's about sharing the knowledge about. Uh, about like making machine learning understandable for everyone in a sense that we kind of democratize the knowledge right i think everyone deserves to know if they want to know like if if they want to learn machine learning i feel like everyone should be able 
uh, to learn it. And I'm happy to do my part in that. Um, so what did I get done today? Or what did we get done on the stream today? Uh, we actually read some paper. Pa uh, we read uh, 10 pages or 8 pages. Uh, we read 8 pages of Bishop. Chapter 5, uh, section 1 point, section 1. Uh, then we watched the fast AI lesson one video, which was one hour and 60, uh, 36 minutes and 24, 42 seconds. I don't recall exactly. Oh, 34 seconds. My bad. One hour, 26 and 34 seconds. Let's see. I'm getting tired. I... Um, so actually I'm really happy we did that because we learned some very, very, very important Jupiter, uh, notebook shortcuts, uh, such as, uh, shift tab once, twice, and thrice and the question, question mark command. So those are actually really important. Um, and I'm kind of, I kind of feel stupid now that I that I didn't know them because I've been using Jupyter notebooks for like forever. Uh, but this will step up my game like significantly. Uh, how did this compare? Well, I kind of, in all honesty, I started out kind of, kind of tired. I didn't sleep too well. Uh, so I drank some coffee and session two and three were really good. Where did I get bogged down? Um, well, watching the video, um, I had bad audio for you guys. Hopefully, you didn't mind. What went well? Um, I don't know. I liked I liked streaming again. Haven't streamed in a while. Sorry for that. What did we do on the previous stream, actually? I think we visualized in your net, right? And then I had to run really... F yeah. yeah. That was cool. In three hours, we did uh in three uh that's also I, I i should i didn't continue with that as well right uh it was first neural network it was viz and n right where we um where we made the plot i think it was this one so i think i tried i think i tried working on that a bit uh when i was uh, waiting for someone um I think I was, but I still couldn't, uh, I still couldn't get the model to, uh, to work as I wanted to, right? So we are definitely going to continue working on this project, um, because I'm really sure that we should be able to, to do it with a simple, uh, with a neural network. Okay, so next stream we're gonna try and get a collab notebook up and running. Um, yeah, we streamed for three hours, um, and yeah. So thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Uh, this is it for today. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm gonna stream tonight, but I doubt it um, because I have to go like I have like like now I have to go and then I have to go in the evening again. So. I, I have like this small break, but I'm not sure if it's worth it to only stream for like one hour or one and a half hours. Um, well, I'm really glad that I streamed today and I hope I was able to provide some entertaining content for you guys. Uh, so next week or tomorrow, well, next week, I mean next stream, next stream we are going to try and set up a collab notebook um, for the fast AI lesson one. So what we managed to get done t t like today uh, is we read a bit of Bishop and then we spent two hours uh, watching the lecture on deep learning at a, at a, at a high speed. And in general, it was kind of useful, but not really. But at the same time, it did explain their philosophy where their philosophy means like, um, let's first get something to work. And then once we have it working, we can start peeling back layers like an onion, right? Um, so I'm going to save this. Could not be saved. Hmm, interesting. All right, then uh, forget about it. Don't save. All right, fast 
AI. Maybe I'm gonna download the AI. Uh, wait, let me do this. I should have done this like a long time ago. Uh, we're gonna take this and we're gonna make it nice. All right, so I can get rid of this now. Oops, I shut down everything now. I think. No, not 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 yet. Okay. Um. Mm. Mm, why is the neural network not working? I'm very upset that, like, it has such a big loss. So, I'm quite upset that it has such a big loss for some reason. Um, so, like, we make this, we make this, and then we train it with the training data and the labels, but... So what if we print training data and then we print like, I don't know, first 20, first 20 odd observations. You didn't implement a bias. That's very true. Oh, I didn't implement a bias. Huh. Oh. You are correct, right? We didn't use a bias at all. Do you think that could be the issue? Huh. So, technically, we could just use any... Um, so, all we have to do is change this right and we have to change this so maybe we can use uh maybe we can do that the next session as well because i really want to visualize that boundary okay so um that's gonna be it uh thank you guys so much for tuning in today i had a great time uh, hopefully you guys had a great time. Uh, so for those who are tuning in at the very last moment, you came at the wrong moment. But uh, we did the fast AI uh, lesson one today. We we watched the lecture together. Uh, and next week we are gonna or next week next stream we are gonna code up uh, like a collab notebook and see if we can get the ResNet thirty four working. Uh, yeah. So, again, I want to thank you all so much for having me. I had a great time. I hope you guys had a great time. Uh, and hopefully we see each other tomorrow. I don't know what time I'll, I will be streaming. Probably somewhere at uh, noon, like 12. Or maybe in the morning. Uh, depends on my mood a bit. Um, so, yeah. Again, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I had a great time. Wait. Uh, yeah. I... I had a great time. Hopefully you guys had a great time. Uh, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much.